Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome back to EIC 3204. So this is recording for um, lecture three. We are going to talk about modes of uh, planar uh, waveguide. Uh, so basically mo modes of uh, fiber. We know there are uh, there is single mode fiber and there are a multi-mode fiber. So what is modes? So simply put, modes is a number of uh, legitimate paths for the optical signal to propagate through the fiber. So let's take a closer look. So we have, uh, uh, we have snail's law that tells us about the direction. And then we have a Fresnel uh, formula that tells us the strength. So we have TE polarization so that we can investigate uh, the strength change in the electric uh, field. So I have this equation, and then we have Snell's law that tells us the, uh, the direction. So here, from this equation to here, we just replace uh, theta 2 as a function of theta 1. So there is only theta 1 here. And the next step, So, uh, so this is the same as previous equation. And then when we have internal reflection, so critical angle. So after critical angle, we have only a uh, reflection. There's no uh, reflection anymore. So we have the relationship of this one. So critical ang angle happens when equality holds. And then all the angles that's bigger than critical angle would become like this. So this would lead to uh, this parameter become complex value. What is complex value? It means because the, the wave itself, e, EI and ER, they are both complex values because there is optical phase. So now the relationship uh, between e, uh, ER and EI there is R, there is a, a, a T polarization. This means whenever we have a reflection, in addition to the direction change, we also impose a phase change to the optical phase. So the optical phase is independent of the directional phase. So this is a complex value. Um, so the angle of this complex value is uh, given here. So I provide you with uh, an extra node, extra node here. So in class, I would have written this uh, step by step on the on the whiteboard. So basically, this is about optical phase change from reflection. So this is optical phase change. It's based on Fresnel's formula. It's not from uh, it's not a, a directional phase from the um, from the uh, from the uh, Snell's formula uh, Snell's law. So the definition of so the of Fresnel formula give us this equation first, and then. Based on Snell's uh, law, we replace uh, theta two, theta two, by a function of theta one. So I have this, and the next step we put n two here inside of the square root. So I have this equation here, and the next step we put n one. Uh, we normalize n one, so n one is disappeared from from here but it's inside the square root. And then because of critical angle, any angle that's bigger than critical angle would have this relationship, which means this, uh, this thing inside the square root is a negative, has a negative value. When this has a negative value, the whole parameter, the whole factor become complex valued. 
So we have a minus j b, and then a plus j b. So the minus inside here, square root of minus 1 become j. So b equals this one here, and a equals this one here. This is a, and inside here, this is minus b, because square root minus uh, negative sign is uh, is j so uh, so this is uh, so so the top part and bottom part they are conjugate conjugate of each other so we can just normalize uh, we can just multiply uh, a uh, a minus j b to both sides so now we have the real part is this one and then imaginary part is this one so if we want to know the angle, we can just do a arc tangent function with uh, the imaginary part divided by the real part. But this expression is not very neat. What we really want is just b divided by a. So based on tangent half angle formula, if there is a half angle, uh, tangent ha uh, tangent of half angle. So we have uh, we put b uh, divided by a in here. In here, then this one is completely equivalent to this one. You can extend this and have a look. So this one here is completely equivalent to this one. So in the end, uh, this arc uh, this theta. So this. Uh, Phase rotation imposed by TE polarization is directly arc tangent uh, B divided by A and, uh, and uh, two times of this angle because it's half angle. We have a negative sign here. We'll, we will deal with this negative sign later. So those are the steps. Um, Let's come back to the slides. So actually, I forgot to ask you something at the beginning of uh, this lecture. So in the previous lecture, lecture two, we learned um, acceptance uh, angle. So we need to we need to put light in, in into fiber. We need to make sure that the input angle is within this range, so that when the uh, light get into the fiber, we have critical angle for each core cladding uh, reflection. So there is only reflection here, there's no refraction. So the question here is that if we do not consider for moments uh, attenuation or dispersion, and we input light, uh, inside of the acceptance uh, rate, uh, sorry, acceptance angle, then the light can propagate down the fiber without any um, without any distortion, true or false. So basically, an incident ray with input angle less than the acceptance angle, it can propagate through the fiber, true or false. The so answer is actually false because the, the acceptance uh, angle here is completely derived based on Snell's law. And Snell's law only tells us the direction. So we only guarantee critical angle here. So we preserved the direction of the wave. But at the same time, we also need to preserve the phase of the optical signal. We need to preserve the optical phase. And we can only do that using Fresnel formula. So Snell's law itself is not enough. We need to preserve both the direction and the optical phase. And now, based on a Fresnel formula, we know that for each 
for each reflection, we have a complex valued factor. And this factor would impose a phase rotation onto the optical phase. The phase rotation is this phase rotation of Te polarization, which is a function of uh, the angle and also the refractive uh, indexes. So eventually we need to cancel this so that we actually preserve the optical phase for each reflection. There is another source of phase rotation we need to consider. So remember uh, when we talk about what is phase, so if we think about sun, theta is a periodic function and the wave would propagate in time domain and also in distance. So I have sine k z. So k z. So basically, as the signal propagate uh, through distance, there will be phase change. We need to cancel that as well. So K tells us how fast the wave propagates over distance. So the propagation uh, constant in vacuum is given by this, with the refractive uh, index in this medium. K is given by this. So for K, for propagation over distance, we have two projections. One projection is on the on the on the Z direction, which is straight down the core. That is desired. We don't need to do anything for that direction. Another direction is projection onto the Y axis. So if we have a fiber, the wave would propagate a portion of the wave would propagate down the core. Another one would go up and then go down, go up and go down. It, it is a standing wave. It doesn't go anywhere. We need to cancel this. We need to cancel the phase rotation that's generated by this standing wave. So the standing wave is the propagation, has a propagation constant uh, multiply cosine theta. So theta is, uh, yeah. So cosine theta here, y direction. So if the thickness of the fiber is h, then one round trip would generate two h and then propagation constant this much of phase rotation. This is a phase rotation of the standing wave. We need to cancel this on the y direction. So this is basically the propagation uh, constant projected on the standing wave. And then the thickness is, two, uh, is h. So one, one round is 2h. Another phase rotation is a Te uh, polarization. We uh, calculated before based on Fresnel formula. So overall, we have this standing wave phase rotation. And then we have two Te polar polarization phases because we have reflection at the top once and then reflection at the bottom once one round trip. So we need to make sure that uh, both phase rotation from a uh, standing wave and from Te polarization become multiple of 2 pi so that this phase is cancelled. We, we need to observe the optical phase. So uh, earlier we have a negative sign, so we put negative sign here. So I'm here, we, we need I'm to be uh, integers so that this whole phase is uh, 
uh, uh, cancelled. So if there's only uh, one legitimate number for m, so m only can equal to zero, then it's single mode. If m can be multiple integers, then it's multiple mode. If there's no legitimate m to support this, then the light cannot propagate through the fiber. Let's uh, look at an example here. So we have the parameter of uh, uh, re refractive indexes of core and then, uh, of uh, the cladding. And then we have the thickness here. We have the wavelengths. So based on wavelengths, we can calculate the propagation constant 2 pi over wavelengths. And then based on thickness, uh, sorry, based on the uh, uh, refractive uh, indexes, we can calculate the critical angle. So we have two phase changes. Let's look at the uh, MATLAB code because this is related to your coursework. Um, so first of all, uh, we, we input all these parameters, um, N1, N2, thickness, and wavelengths. And then we calculate the critical angle. The variable is the phase that we need to, uh, the legitimate phase that can support the, the optical uh, propagation. So basically, uh, at, at which, so from zero to half, um, half of the pi, which phase can support uh, uh, can cancel both a uh, standing wave and the polarization. So we have this variable here, and then we calculate the TE, and then we calculate the TE polarization based on based on this, and then we draw the the right line. So basically, the part below critical angle, they are all, all zero. They, are, they don't have any meaning to us. So we, we don't need to uh, plot that part. So we only care about the part that's bigger than critical angle. So we draw the right line here. So this is a TE polarization. And then we draw the, the right line. And then we need to calculate the phase rotation uh, that's introduced by standing wave. So we, we first set m equals zero. And then we calculate uh, this part with re respect to theta. So we have the first line here. There is an intersection. It means when m equals zero, we have this phase that can support the preserve, uh, uh, that, that can preserve optical phase. So this is a legitimate uh, path for the optical signal. And then we increase m to one, we get another curve, and then another intersection, uh, sorry, there is no intersection with uh, the, the right line. So this is a single mode uh, fiber. There is only one intersection here. So another example, if we increase the thickness to 10 times uh, thicker, then for the MATLAB code, we also input all the parameters, and then we calculate critical angle, and then we have all the variables so the T polarization, we calculate the, the phase rotation that's uh, caused by T polarization. Uh, for all the, all the phases uh, smaller than critical angle, we set them to be zero. And then we plot the right line as a TE polarization phase rotation. 
And then we uh, calculate the phase rot rotation imposed by the standing wave. So with m equals 1, m equals 2, m equals 3, we plot three lines. And then we have three intersections. This means we will have three modes. OK, so this is actually uh, related to your uh, coursework. So basically, uh, coursework is a little bit different, but similar to uh, what we have shown uh, in, the, in the example. So th uh, here we have a, sy a symmetric uh, refractive indexes. So the top is N3, bottom is N2. Originally, we have N2 for both of them. And then the core is N1. So now the calculation we, we need to do is uh, for the, first of all, for the standing wave, it's the same. And then for the T polarization, we have two here because we have one at the top, one at the bottom. So now uh, the, the, the one at the top is still with N2 and N1. The one at the bottom, the reflection at the bottom, would, would be with N3 and N1. So we need to have three parts. We have the standing wave, phi h, and then we have the Te for the, for the, and then we have the Te for the, for the top. And then we have another Te for the bottom. So this one is with N1 and N2. This one is with uh, N1 and N3. You also need to modify a little bit on the program. Um, so you plot uh, the T polarization, then the standing wave phase rotations. Uh, so one thing to be careful about is that here, I ask, uh, determine the number of possible modes um, theoretically. It means when you draw the figure here, sometimes um, so one thing you need to check uh, to check is that uh, the TE phase here uh, below um, critical angle they are all zero. And then because your curve is a uh, discrete, uh, is interpolated from it, it is interpolated from a discrete uh, variable. So all the variables here they are discrete. So if you have a value here very high, it would jump up, but it doesn't mean uh, there is an intersection. So theoret theoretically, what you need to check is at critical angle. Okay, at critical angle, the value of this function and the value of all the other functions. So if the value of this function is lower than the value of the other functions, then you have three modes. If this value is uh, higher than all of them, then you don't have any modes. So be careful about this. Because sometimes when you draw the figure, there is a sudden jump, and it seems smooth, but actually it is a described jump. So if it's smooth, you probably will see intersection, but if it's a described jump, you don't see uh, uh, intersection. I hope that makes sense. You can start from modifying uh, the MATLAB coding here and then see uh, how many modes are there. Uh, yeah, so that's a uh, coursework. Okay, so uh, here there's an important sentence, but it's a more con it's it's only conceptual. So here it says optical fiber confines light in two rather than uh, one cross sectional dimension. This basically mean basically means that uh, uh, 
a fiber is 3D, it's not 2D. So uh, we, what we did before was planar waveguide, which means it's in 2D. The reflection are like this. But if it's 3D, the light can actually spiral down the core. So what we normally do is to project the 3D spiral light onto 2D first, and then apply uh, Snell's law and Fresnel formula. So this is only a general background knowledge. So we have Uh, we can have multi we can have multi mode fiber and then we can have single mode fiber this profile here tells us that the refractive index for the core is higher than the refractive index of the uh, cladding so that light is uh, confined in the core so um, so for the for the multi-mode fiber, we have multiple paths. So recall that in lecture two, I ask, do we want N1 and N2 as different as possible or as uh, close as possible? So a rule of thumb is that we want N1 and N2 to be as close as possible because first of all, the critical angle is uh, N2 divided by N1. So if these are very, uh, so the two indexes that are close to each other, theta 1 would be approaching to 90 degree. There wouldn't be much room for multi-pass. So we don't always want multi-pass. Why? Different paths, they travel different distances. Then at the other end of the fiber, they would arrive with different delay. This would cause dispersion. So single pass is better, single mode is better. So we want these two to be as close to each other as possible so we can have single mode fiber. Another reason I didn't mention in uh, the recording of lecture two is that uh, you know, if we want, if we make N1 and N2 to be very different from each other, what we need to do is we need to uh, do a lot of doping. We need to add dopant. When we add more dopant, we will cause higher attenuation. So there will be more scattering. There, it will be higher attenuation. So for single mode fiber, N1 and N2, they are supposed to be quite close to each other. So in this way, we, uh, we don't suffer from very serious uh, attenuation anymore. I will mention, I will explain all of this uh, again later when we uh, introduce attenuation and dispersion. So sometimes we want a graded index fiber so the profile you see here, so uh, the core has very high N1, and then for cladding, it has lower N2. So we want a gradually reduced uh, refractive index. Why? So the core has higher N. What is N? N equals speed of light in a vacuum divided by speed of light in the medium. So when N is very high as a core, it means its velocity is very low. So the core, uh, as, a, as a core, the light would travel at a slower speed. And then for the longer pass, they, uh, they, tra they, they travel a longer distance, but they travel at higher speed. So if we gradually change this speed, we can make sure that all the multi paths they arrive at a smaller time difference, a smaller delay difference. So the longer path is longer, but we travel faster. And then shorter path 
it is shorter, but will travel slower. So the delay difference between different paths becomes smaller. So that, that is basically the purpose of graded index. We're going to see this uh, again later on. Okay, so advantage of step index, we have, um, uh, so, so we have uh, the same uh, uh, high refractive index for the whole core for all the multipaths. And then we have a lower index as a cloud, uh, for the clouding. So this would allow LED. Uh, so we will talk about this uh, next week. Uh, so this would be a lower at a lower cost, but different paths they would arrive at different delay. So this would cause dispersion. And here, uh, for the single uh, for single mode fiber, uh, the advantage is there is only one mode, so there is a very low dispersion if there have any. So basically, the dispersion is caused by different wavelengths. They travel at different speed. We'll, we'll talk about that later. So in general, the dispersion is uh, lower and the cost is higher. So a rule of thumb is that normally for long haul communication, we use single mode fiber. For example, for the fiber that connect countries or continents, we deploy fibers under the sea. An interesting thing, so uh, we know that the first uh, undersea fiber that connect America and uh, Europe was deployed in 1988. And then since uh, the uh, si uh, since uh, 19th, uh, it happens when the fiber underwater uh, they, they broke from time to time. So there is a conspiracy that uh, a uh, shark ate them, um, and some people would even go very far uh, to investigate: uh, is it a light from the fiber that attracted the shark's attention, or uh, the material of glass that tastes very delicious to glass uh, to to sharks? Um, but anyway, there is no evidence that fiber is just delicious to shark, but. Uh, it does happen from time to time that uh, fiber um, broke from uh, different kind of reasons. Okay, now we are going to talk about dispersion and uh, attenuation. So the most classic uh, dispersion in fiber is called chromatic dispersion. So it happens when basically for any light we have uh, for any light source, we have a collection of wavelengths and they travel at a different speed. So as a transmitter, we have well separated pulses. And then after traveling down the fiber, we have pulses, uh, uh, they kind of uh, uh, broaden. So they kind of overlap with each other. They introduce inter symbol interference, they introduce inter simple interference. So I was asked why this didn't happen in uh, radio frequency wireless communication. So for wireless communication, the coverage is a lot smaller compared to fiber. For example, wireless communication can only cover like uh, or campers. So for that distance, so the speed of light difference for different wavelengths wouldn't show, wouldn't show any effect. But for fiber, we are talking about very long distance across continents. So after traveling that long, it would be a small percentage of, uh, of the, the Earth's uh, 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 a really, really, uh, really big percentage of uh, uh, distance on the Earth. Um, so for, for that uh, lens, uh, the different speed of different wavelengths would um, really make an effect. So the pulse would, would become broadened. 
So how do we represent uh, inter symbol interference uh, in equation? So basically, if you transmit one symbol and then receive one symbol, uh, this is channel, and then maybe you have noise as well, then there is no interfer uh, symbol interference. However, if you receive one symbol, that is summation of delayed version of, uh, of, of the transmitting symbols, then there is inter-symbol interference. So this is obtained by a uh, convolved pro product between the transmitted symbol and the, and the channel. So this also happens in RF radio frequency, but it is, uh, it is not from chromatic dispersion. It is from multi-pass. So I have long sight, and then we have a lot of other paths and they arrive with different delays. So how did we mitigate this in uh, RF? We use OFDM. So basically, we use OFDM because the convolutional product in the time domain would become a single tap product in the frequency domain. So we use Fourier transform, and we modulate symbols in the uh, frequency domain. But optical communication don't know, normally use OFDM uh, because uh, bandwidth is not a big problem in fiber. So basically, when this happens in RF, it means the coherence bandwidth is smaller than the modulation bandwidth. So the signal cannot in the frequency domain cannot pass through the channel without causing inter interference. So what we do with OFDM in the frequency domain is that we divide the channel to sub-channels and then each one would pass through uh, without causing interference. But in, uh, in fiber, the bandwidth that can provide it by the medium is a lot larger than the modulation, uh, real practical modulation bandwidth. So normally we just use a quadric, uh, chromatic dispersion to, uh, for for analysis, and we, we try to avoid this uh, effect instead of using mathematics to mitigate it. Um, I'll talk more about this uh, a bit later again. So basically, uh, dispersion would broaden the pulse duration. So at the beginning, it's tau zero, and then later on, it's tau one. So besides dispersion, we also have attenuation. Attenu this is also similar to RF, uh, also similar to the wireless communication, where we have free space pass loss. The signal would uh, uh, attenuate over distance. So when signal propagate over distance, the signal power would become smaller. In optical spectrum, it's a similar concept, but the attenuation varies uh, a lot with the wavelengths. So we can see the baseline here is uh, really scattering. This is intrinsic, we cannot do anything about it. Um, really scattering is also why we see blue sky and why we see when, when there is sun, sun, uh, sunrise and sunset, we see the orange color illuminate the sky. It's because there are uh, uh, particles in in the uh, atmosphere that cause scattering to the sunlight, and the the size of the uh, particle decides that it causes different degree of scattering to different wavelengths of uh, of 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 visible light. So with so it causes different uh, attenuation to different color basically. So this is intrinsic. We cannot really do anything about it. And then, as I mentioned earlier, here for single mode fiber, we have lower attenuation. For multi-mode fiber, we have higher attenuation because we need to do more doping and it would cause more scattering. It would cause more attenuation. 
then here we have an intrinsic peak where at these wavelengths the power would be absorbed more by water element. We also cannot do anything about it. We only uh, what we can do is to not use this band. We just avoid this. So normally what we use um, is we use three wave bands. So for the for the short for the short uh, wave band, it's basically from the legacy system, so it's lower cost. We use that before, but the attenuation here is still quite high. So we are moving on to a medium wave uh, band right now, where attenuation is uh, smaller. We'll talk. Uh, we'll uh, we'll see later that dispersion in this band is very low. So this band is really good for low dispersion, and attenuation is uh, fairly low as well. For long wave band, we have more band waves, and the attenuation is the lowest. So long wave band is really good for low attenuation. We'll see later that its dispersion is a little bit worse than the medium wave band. Okay. So the three bands. So let's uh, do some calculation for the dispersion. Um, so basically, dispersion means the, the pulse duration is broadened. So at the beginning, uh, as an input, we have tau 0. And then as a fiber output, we have tau 1. What we want to ensure that is that the, the broadening is smaller than half of the duration. So that the peak of this pulse wouldn't interfere with the peak of the next pulse. So we want to make sure that the broadening here is smaller than half of the modulation duration, uh, the period, modulation period. And the sampling period determines the, uh, the bit rate that can, that can be supported by the system. So basically, this uh, delay uh, threshold tells us how much bit rate can be supported by the system. So uh, let's consider uh, multi mode. Uh, well, let's consider yeah multi mode of uh, fiber here. So for multi mode fiber, we normally have multiple paths, right? We have multiple paths. So there will be dispersion that caused by different delays from different paths. So this is also called intermodal uh, dispersion. That only uh, happens for multi-mode fiber. So the rule of thumb is that the minimum delay is uh, the direct uh, distance uh, down the core. So the length of the fiber, basically. And then the velocity of the light speed so this is a minimum uh, delay. The maximum delay, rule of thumb, is the, the trajectory that travel with critical angle. So if this is critical angle, then the length of this path is broadened by a sine theta. So this is theta. This is sine theta. So we have length of uh, the fiber and then we have the speed of, of uh, light in this medium. So we have the minimum uh, traveling time, and we have the maximum traveling time. We, meet, we need to make sure that the difference between the minimum time and the maximum time is uh, within half of the modulation duration. So eventually, so we, 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 here we only try to represent this as a function of uh, indexes. So eventually, uh, so a uh, bit rate that can support it by the system it is calculated by this. And this is a uh, uh, maximum delay minus minimum delay. So if we consider an example here, we have speed of light 
and we have the length of fiber, we have the refractive uh, index and the difference between the uh, refract, ref, refractive din, index of the core and the refractive index of the cladding. Then we, we use this equation. We get the throughput, uh, the bit rate that can be supported by the system is 10 megabits per second. This is quite terrible. This is worse than many uh, wireless systems even. But here we use physical fiber. So this is quite terrible. So what we need to do for multi-mode uh, fiber is that we want a graded index fiber so that uh, the light that travel with longer distance would travel faster. And then the light travel with, would travel faster. And then the light travel with a shorter distance would travel slower. So they arrive with smaller delay difference. So this equation is from a reference. We just uh, directly have a look at it based on the previous example. And then we calculate this uh, delay difference. And then this, uh, the system can support bit rate of 8 gigahertz bits per second. So this is a lot better. OK, finally, we have chromatical dispersion. So for single mode uh, uh, fiber, we do not have uh, intermodal dispersion anymore. So we do not have multipass. What we only have is that the wavelengths for different wavelengths, uh, they travel at different speed. So we have a time difference for different wavelengths. So this is also called intramodal uh, dispersion. It is within one mode. This is for single mode fiber. So basically, first of all, we have phase velocity, which is, which is kind of the target velocity. So we know that within one period, we traveled uh, a wavelength of distance, and it costs us t second. So this is a phase uh, velocity. It can be also represented by uh, the angular uh, frequency divided by the propagation constant because of this uh, definition we used before in the part of what is phase. So I have this representation. And then for group velocity, we need to consider the collection of wavelengths. And group velocity, velocity must be valid for all the wavelengths. So what we do is we do a differentiation so that the incremental uh, infinite similarly uh, infinite similarly similarly small um, segment of velocity is valid for the whole collection of wavelengths. So the overall propagation delay is obtained by the length divided by the group velocity. So in order to observe this delay. Uh, with respect to the variation in the frequency of wavelengths, equivalently wavelengths, we need to do another differentiate. Then the equation become more, uh, a lot more complicated. But we don't really need to worry about that because this become equivalent to the problem of Q function in wireless communication. So in wireless communication, for example, Q function is integral on Gaussian PDF. If you write it down, uh, that equation, then it's a very complicated equation. But we use it so many times, so it's kind of a built-in function for all the communication uh, libraries. In, for example, in MATLAB, in IT++, in all the programming languages, there is a Q function, so that you don't really need to uh, worry about the integral on Gaussian PDF. Here is the same. We have two times differentiation. We just put them together as one parameter. So this is only related to the uh, to the medium, to the material. So eventually, we have a simplified version for the for the dispersion. So this is a delay difference. 
that we can use to calculate uh, eventually uh, the data rate a system can support. So this is a, a parameter here, built-in parameter. And this is a length of the fiber. And this is uh, the width of the wavelength uh, in the light source. So the width of wavelengths, also called long width. So in summary, uh, where does chromatic dispersion come from? So it has two uh, uh, reason, there are two reasons for chromatic dispersion to happen. The first one is intrinsic material. So the refractive index itself would vary in the material. Second is the shape of the material. We didn't really mention much about the, uh, the radars or the shape of the material, but it actually contribute to a change in refractive index. So uh, if we look at the dispersion as a function of wavelengths, so previously, if we look back, we have a ten attenuation as a function of uh, wavelengths. We see that we used to use this band, but now we use these two bands, which have lower attenuation. So now if we look at dispersion, So the medium band here has very low dispersion. And then the higher band here, it, it, it has a very low attenuation, but higher dispersion. By the way, the dispersion here are all on the order of picosecond. So for example, if we use a one picosecond as an example here, the system can support 500, if we use one picosecond here, then the system can support 500 gigabit bits per second. That is really, really good for uh, data transmission. That's why we prefer uh, single mode uh, fiber because single mode fiber only has uh, a chromatic dispersion and chromatic dispersion uh, can, uh, if I calculate the delay, we can see that the system can su uh, still support a really high data rate. So now the question is, we have lower attenuation here, but higher dispersion. So how do we deal with this? So we can see a summary here that in the, in the medium of wave band, we have very good uh, low dispersion but attenuation is high. And then for the higher wavelengths, we have high dispersion, but attenuation is low. So how, how, how can we deal with this? So the dispersion curve, we can either shift it or flatten it so that when we use the higher band, the dispersion is low. So how do we do this? We do doping. So we change, um, we change the profile here. We change N1, N1, N2 uh, for the core and the cladding so that it can give us favorable uh, uh, dispersion and uh, favorable dispersion and attenuation. So that's also just a background knowledge. So uh, this actually is related to uh, uh, another part of the coursework. So, so the coursework would have two parts. But this, this coursework is a lot uh, easier than the RF coursework. So basically I give you all the parameters of the refractive indexes and the wavelengths and also the thickness of the fiber. Um, so, so first you need to calculate critical, critical angle, which can be calculated based on the refractive indexes. And you need to calculate the numerical aperture, which is the acceptance angle 
for getting light inside fiber. It, it is also a function of uh, refractive indexes. And then thirdly, phase velocity, which is uh, a wavelength divided by period. And then propagation constant, which is 2 pi over wavelengths. And the minimum delay and maximum delay. So you need critical angle in here. And then delay difference here, and then you calculate the bit rate. So rule of thumb is that you need this to be less than half of the period. And then one over, if you inverse the period, you get the bit rate. So, uh, so all of these, uh, the, all the related equations are in the in the slides. So this part is quite easy. So okay, that's all for lecture three. Uh, thank you.